Hi, everyone. Lada and Kelly here today. Hi, guys. <laughs> and we are here with Megan Kerman. She is the design manager and art director of social projects at RAA. And we have Aki Carpenter. She's the principal director of social projects. Hi, ladies. How are you? Hi. Hi. So let's get right into it. I'm going to ask a simple question. Who are you, Megan? And how do you do what you do? I am taking on new roles at RAA, helping um, Aki manage across a lot of projects. But we um, are both trained as graphic designers and working in the museum space. So um, yeah, we, we can talk more about projects later, maybe. Nice, and how about you, Aki? Can you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a principal and director of social projects at Ralph Applebaum Associates or RAA. Um, I've been with the studio for about 15 years. Megan has been with us for about probably along, around the same time. So we've around been, 10, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I think as designers, you know, we're at we've been in the studio longer than I think some graphic designers expect to be. But we'll talk about kind of how our projects work and the length of that. Um, but just a little bit about us in our projects seek to tell, I would say, some of the most important um, stories of history and leadership that address topics of social justice, activism, and community. And that's why we're really excited to talk to you two today, because I think we're going to speak around some of those topics. So maybe, Megan, maybe you can expand on kind of how you got started in um, museum design and what, um, what kind of um, how you're your graphic design background kind of intersects with um, your social projects. Yeah. I, Kelly and I went to the same school for undergrad. We, we, we went to Iowa State University, which has a pretty strong graphic design program. And I, um, ex I, I would say my experience in school was mostly around branding. I didn't do exhibit design. There was a, there was one class in exhibit design exhibit design that I didn't take. Um, I didn't even really, I don't think I knew what it was, to be honest with you. And I, um, my trajectory after school was mostly in branding studios. I moved to Minneapolis and worked for various studios there. And I, while I had a really great experience with, with the studio I worked at in Minneapolis for many years, I started to lose a lot of interest in the type of design work I was doing. And I got to this place where I was like, I don't even know if I wanna be a graphic designer anymore. I'm not sure I want to do corporate branding work. Like it didn't, it wasn't like feeding me and it wasn't making me feel like I was making an impact. And I moved from Minneapolis for like a very short time to Western Massachusetts. And I like worked in a restaurant and I kind of took this big break from design. And um, that experience was connecting me to um, like farm to table food movement and working with farmers. And I was like, this feels better. Like I was grasping for work that felt important to me. And when I moved to New York, I was like, I'll either work for restaurant, like the restaurant world doing like continuing this kind of food and this food um, farm to table, like connection to farmers and land, or I'll get back into design, but it has to be something that I feel connected to. And I was applying to work in house at some museums. And then I was connected with Aki through another call, uh, classmate from Iowa state actually. And um I was like, oh, this is amazing. Even then, I remember my mom being like, so you're working for an architecture firm? And I was like, yep, I think so. Like, I really still didn't totally understand what RAA did. And um, it felt like this kind of museum world exhibit design thing that just like I ne never knew much about. Um, so I started working at RAA about, about 10 years ago. And um, Aki and I, work together from the beginning across a few different projects. But um, the, I guess my point is that the quality of work we do has that kind of like education component and history and, um, you know, sharing histories that maybe are less told uh, historically. So it's, it has just been like 
the thing that's kept me interested in, in doing design work, I would say. Yeah. Aki, maybe you can, you know, talk to us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got connected with RAA. Um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about as the director of social projects, like how does that fit in with the broader scope of work at RAA too? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to. Um, I also had kind of a meandering path like Megan trying to find um, where I kind of felt most invested in design. I, you know, I trained in graphic design like Megan at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, still in Brooklyn. Um, and I, you know, I, I kind of left school working in, I would say more like the lifestyle space. So fashion, music, um, even like art, you know, art related, but I actually was really focused kind of in the Lower East Side hip hop, like sneaker. I was working for Nike and um, different hip hop musicians and it was awesome and I love that space. But I think um, after being kind of working in that area for a while, I realized that, you know, the shelf life of the design was, was very short and the kind of audience or the group or the impact of the design was very small. And that made me realize that, you know, I really wanted to work on projects that had um, more of a social justice angle, more of a community angle, a larger impact, and started trying to understand how can design impact learning and public space. Um, I won't go into all the details, but like any young designer, I was applying for like, you know, every job that I saw, it kind of didn't matter. So I probably put out like 50, you know, resumes at a time, um, trying to stay in New York. And I started, I actually got a call back from an exhibit design um, place. And at the time I was like, what does this mean? Like writing, like designing labels for objects. Like it is a really opaque space, like to Megan's point, you know, it's not something that you're necessarily like, I don't know what we think, like museums just kind of appear out of nowhere. Um, that's certainly what I thought. Um, or you think of it more as a, you know, repository for um, research and Present preservation of materials. Um, and that's a lot about what we think about um, as part of social projects is what is the role of a museum now. Um, but before I go there, so I, you know, I ended up getting into the exhibit design space and really enjoyed um, the idea that we were creating spaces for people um, and creating spaces that delivered um, content that made people more mindful of the world that they're in and connected them to history and allowed them to see themselves as part of this history. Um, so I, I joke with Megan that like the work we do allows me to sleep at night <laughs> because, you know, I really want as a designer, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do maybe more, um, you know, trendy and kind of of the time or more, you know, ornamental design. Um, and, you know, Megan and I have talked about that, how we kind of started our careers in that way. But we wanted to find a space that was, um, you know, as young designers, I think we were looking for something that had more impact. Um, so just a little bit about the social, um, what social impact means, I think, at RAA and as the director of social projects, we're really looking at projects um, with a social justice focus that are you know, thinking about reinventing what a museum is, what the role is and how public space is used. Um, I would say we're really focused on elevating marginalized narratives and how we can kind of support um, that work a lot of museums are doing now. So the role of museums, um, who's making these projects, how are they made? Um, that's all really important to us in terms of who's on our team how um, we're engaged with the community, how the institution is get engaged in the community. It's a really non-diverse field, um, historically non-diverse. And so um, when I say community engagement, it's not just asking, do you like the color blue? Um, you know, where I like to start is, this is what a museum project is. This is what an exhibit designer is. This is what a museum archivist is. This is the creative process, I think. You know, the creative process and design is something that's really opaque to many people. And the more kind of understanding and ownership we can provide um, around the process that we're doing, um, I think that's like our kind of mandate as designers to ensure that the people who are visiting um, our projects have ownership and understanding of how these places are built. So that's really important to me in terms of how we do our work. Um, of course, the kind of environmental justice, I think we were talking about that before this call, but 
we all know how interwoven that is with racial justice. So thinking about that in terms of our project, um, the kind of voices, the collective vision around building um, the vision for the new project, you know, often I would say these projects, you know, necessarily are built off of scholarship and that's very important, but we need to make sure that it's not a top down development, that there is a bottom up development. So thinking about how we can shape our projects in that way. Um, I could go on, um, <laughs> but that's maybe just a quick overview of how we think about social impact. Thank you for sharing, Aki. So I'll go back to Megan. Um, so as designers and artists trying to do work in this space that you know impacts lives, um, and we talk about that all the time, how do you recommend students show their in interest in the industry? You shared a little bit about how you have done that, um, how you felt that inside of you that you wanted to get out of this corporate kind of design world. Um, but how do you recommend that they veer off into this new direction and really, really impact communities around them? Um, I think exploring the ways that you can like connect through your interests. I don't know if it starts with like doing freelance projects or um, connecting with organizations and institutions that you just admire. I think that was the one thing that I started realizing that I needed to just contact the people I wanted to work with. You know, it wasn't like throwing out like Aki described and I did the exact same thing, like sending my resume and my portfolio around to just every studio that I could think of. It's like targeting the um, types of organizations, institutions, whatever that feel that you feel connected to and figuring out a way to uh, work together. I don't know if it's like offering up design services as a designer, that would be maybe what I would, um, could imagine. But um, yeah, I don't know if that's the most complete answer, but. Well, I wonder, yeah, oh, I mean, Yaki can uh, add to that. No, 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 I think that's great advice, Megan. I, I mean, I think, you know, Megan and I were also talking about this. We've seen a really exciting shift in the portfolios that are coming out of the new generation of designers. Um, yeah. Like when we were in school, not to date ourselves, but um, you know, I think it was a lot more superficial design that was kind of trendy at the time. Um, and I'm just really moved by all these young designers who are looking to design for good or, you know, focus on social justice or social change. Um, so that's been really inspiring. And I, I would say like one thing that is really hard to navigate um, is where to apply, like Megan is saying, like, how do you identify where to go? Um, so of course there's places like REA, which again is very specialized, like kind of under the radar, but there are a lot of these studios that are focused on um, what I call narrative environments or learning in public. There are also places that are focused on um, public space design, which has its own implications, um, thinking about social change and who has access. Um, there are branding or branding studios that focus on the cultural sector or nonprofits. Um, and then I could say outside of the consulting space, there's foundations that are doing incredible work um, that always need designers to support. Um, and then of course, working in-house within institutions is also a place to look. Um, and then also there's, there's you know, the startup world and the tech world, but I think there are some spaces within that um, that have real um, meaningful commitments to social change. Um, we've, you know, seen revolts <laughs> in a lot of these industries over the last year, um, but I have seen some that have, you know, kind of risen to the top in terms of, um, uh, I would say, beyond commitment, like actual action. Um, so looking for those types of spaces that are, you know, doing that work. Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about like authenticity too, like authenticity from that's coming from the students that you see that or, you know, finding that authenticity within firms that you're looking for um, and and connection too. like you guys are always talking about how you're connecting to the topics that you're researching. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, a project or two that you're really, really proud of and you know how that project made a really big impact on the community just as an example 
I can start, but I think we're going to have the same answer. Um, and so I'll, I'll say some and Megan, you can say some. Um, well, I mean, the last project that Megan and I worked on was the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC on the mall. It's a Smithsonian Museum Institution. Um, it was a six year project for us. Of course, we were part of a much larger effort. I mean, actually the making of this museum was, it's a hundred years in the making. Um, so without telling you the entire historic background of the making of the African American Museum, you know, it's just a, an honor to even be part of that piece of history. Um, I think the kind of power of a narrative that has been so oppressed and so marginalized being set in stone by the Smithsonian on the mall, you know, I, it, like, Megan, as I get weepy even like talking about this project, but it's, it really, I don't think anything will top that project for me because it, um, it just, I think there's not, there's, there's no, there's nothing, you know, more complicated to talk about than race in America. And I think being able to talk about that um, in that museum is just so important. Um, people ask us a lot, what is our favorite design moment? You know, <laughs> having worked on the design for so many years, collaborating with the architects, collaborating with the curators. And I actually like, I can't pick a design moment because it's actually not about that. I think it's about creating a platform for intergenerational connection and conversation. It's about a space, a safe space for dialogue and just being in that space and seeing it with people in our design is the most moving thing, um, you know, I, I think I will ever experience. So um, Megan, I'll let you pick up on that, but I, I'm sure that you feel the same way. All the same things that you saying, yeah, I think, our projects, the timelines of our projects are really long. Um, I didn't even join that team from the beginning, but I worked on it for like five or six years. <laughs> so that, and that wasn't the beginning of it. But um, yes, being in the space and seeing just visitors and like our families as we've been able to bring our families and it, it's just really uh, like the top. I think I think we'll never have a project that we feel that um, proud of, but we have kind of continued to do to work on amazing projects in that same vein, maybe at a smaller scale um, that have also been really inspiring. Aki and I are working on a really comparatively tiny project in Montgomery, Alabama for the Freedom Rides Museum, which is like uh, also so amazing. And it has, um, the museum is actually in the Greyhound bus station where um, the Freedom Riders were met by angry mobs in Montgomery. And so the power of that space and the power of the place where the museum is, is really incredible. Um, Montgomery is like just so dense with amazing things happening. So that's one of like many really incredible institutions. Um, so we, part of our work is, you know, connecting with the community that, that our museums are in. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't know. We could probably list. Huh. I mean, I guess listening. another one, um, you know, that we're working on now, right now I'm leading the museum at the Obama Presidential Center. Megan's working on that with me as well as art director. Um, and that one just, you know, the African American Museum in DC, the history galleries basically start um, with the Middle Passage, um, but the, they end with the election of the first African American presidents. They end with the president, you know, the election of President Barack Obama. And so for us to be able to pick up that narrative, and help him and Mrs. Obama and their administration um, tell the story of their, you know, eight years in office, um, but sort of the history that got them there. You know, President Obama always emphasizes on whose shoulders we he stands, we stand. Um, so I think being able to like literally pick up that piece of history and then work on the project um, in the south side of Chicago um, for the Obama Foundation is obviously a huge honor as well. Um, very different than a Smithsonian um, institution in terms of, you know, the collections and even the storytelling itself. Um, 
But what's really exciting about that project is the work that the foundation is doing and the kind of really rigorous and impressive and meaningful programming that they have um, in place actually now, but also um, will be at the future site um, in Chicago and it's all around civic leadership. And so we, in this new project, um, think a lot about how can we actually tie history to action um, and sort of make those meaningful connections to those leadership programs. So it's a different type of um, challenge, you know, um, from some of our other projects. And it's a really exciting one to sort of iterate and innovate around. Well, and this is like a side note question that's not on our list, but I think it, um, it made me think about, um, and Megan, maybe you can expand on this a little bit, but like the artifacts that you guys deal with, like it's not just about designing the space, but like you guys really um, curate with curators, like on your team, like what types of items you're gonna show, like maybe talk a little bit about more like the hands-on aspect or, you know, like Aki's mentioning the programming, like you're really getting down to, you know, not just designing what's in the space, but how the space works, right? Yeah, I think we we work really um, hard at the, like the experience and how you learn in different ways. And um, Aki often describes it as like the syncopation of the experience, like making sure that you are learning through objects or learning through a media program or learning through, you know, didactic um, content. Um, so the, you mentioned artifacts, like often an artifact could be like passed by without interpretation, you know, it's something that is often without explanation, maybe it's a very simple thing but stories behind these like incredible collections that many of our um, our projects have really need that kind of background. So we like to use artifacts to describe, to describe people and like as a stand-in for people. Um, so yeah, that's one, one aspect. Aki, I'm sure you have more. Uh, may, um maybe I can talk a little bit about like the process of how we design for yeah. storytelling, which is, is gets to the kind of artifact piece of it. Um, again, this is something that's very opaque and we all had to kind of dive in and learn, but it is such a exhibition, exhibition design is such a multidisciplinary process. So within our studio, you know, there are the graphic designers, but there are also 3d designers. Um, who are, you know, trained in architecture, interior architecture, even product design sometimes. So, um, and then we have our content development folks. Um, what's really great, I think, about our studio um, and the way we approach exhibit design is that there's a lot of different creative perspectives coming into it. So we also have like poets and dancers and fine artists and, you know, so everyone's kind of bringing this different perspective. Um, to the work, but that's that's kind of on our side. And then within the institution, there are the curators um, and, and the leadership, and there's just a sort of a mirrored set of team that we work with. So how we start our work is understanding the story. We, you know, we often say it's like the discovery or the immerse phase. Um, that's pretty standard, I would say, across like design, many design um, industries. Uh, but then once we kind of understand that narrative arc, we are working closely with the architects or the build the existing building, whether we're doing a ground up new building like the African American Museum in DC or working like as Megan mentioned um, with a historic smaller building and Freedom Rides I'm in Montgomery, Alabama for Freedom Rides. But we start mapping that story to the space. So really high level, I kind of talk about it as like the big rocks, like we have to get the big rocks in place. Um, and then we start to think about how can the design deliver this content, um, whether it be through artifacts, through media, and exactly as Megan is saying, we want to make sure that there's a couple things in mind, like how do we provide a variety of experience to keep the visitor engaged, 
Um, but also we think about the different types of visitors we'll have. We call them the streakers, strollers, and studiers. So the folks who are kind of going to like ping pong through and hit the, you know, the intro panels, um, the folks who might, you know, go at a pace and catch the sort of top level, medium level interpretation, and then the people who will read absolutely everything. Um, so we also have to think about how can design support that level of storytelling. Um, and then, uh, and then of course, the artifacts play a, a huge role to understand the collection, understand how, um, you know, something as simple as a cup um, could have been, you know, could be tied to a person that has such sort of importance and meaning um, or an event or a moment in time. So we really try to understand the collections and how artifacts can play a role in that kind of like punctuating of the story. Um, that's kind of exhibit design, I would say. You know, I think for social projects and for projects with social impact, um, a lot of it is going into really, um, I would say interrogating how the content is delivered um, and, and this should be for all projects, um, but we have a special, you know, focus on it in our work, um, which is typically elevating marginalized narratives. So it's really about, you know, respecting the narrative, um, and integrating diverse perspectives, um, so that when we're telling people stories of lives lived, that there is a real consideration around the selection of people who are brought forward. Um, we know that, telling a balanced story is really important. So often these difficult histories um, can potentially be traumatizing or triggering. And so we wanna make sure that we're thinking about how to empower these narratives um, and not, um, not sort of, it, it is about the balance of how to tell a difficult history or difficult narrative. Um, we also think a lot about how to counter prevalent uh, misconceptions. Many of these narratives are tied to um, long historic um, histories that are rooted in white supremacy that, you know, we really have to promote justice and equality throughout our work to ensure that we're, you know, really implementing a position and a tone within the exhibit that is challenging racism and discrimination and white supremacy. Um, so that all goes back, you know, Kelly, to what you were saying about it's, it is about the authentic and how do we really um, respect that and present it in a responsible way. As people doing this work in this space, what kind of advice do you give to the next generation of leaders? I would say like in the more direct advice, like I would reach out to as many people as possible. I think in this moment, um, you know, where people are connecting virtually, um, do not be afraid to reach out to people and ask for their time um, just to learn about what they do. Like informational interviews are a real thing and um, hopefully people are giving of their time. I certainly am and I know Megan is. Um, so really trying to start to understand what's out there and learn about um, different industries or different studios or even learn from a certain person. Um, it's a great, uh, I would say silver lining of, of the moment we're in um, take risks. I know that sounds cheesy, but I do think, you know, there's a lot of issues with, um, barriers that are put in place for a lot of young people. And I think, um, you might look at qualifications, uh, or requirements for job positions. And I, I, I often feel that young people, um, don't apply for things because there's a bullet in that list that they don't feel like they can meet. And I would say still apply and try to talk to someone because um, I think requirements around jobs need to be wholesale, you know, rethought generally. That's something that I think needs a lot of work, but um, not to sort of be discouraged by some of that language. Um, and then something that like Megan and I have talked a lot about is just, um, Mentorship, I know that's easier said than done, but if you see someone that you would love to learn from or just be connected to, or maybe they can help find someone to mentor you. I, I've been very lucky to have um, a mentor in my life and I think I definitely wouldn't be here without that person. Um, so I think if you can find someone that you you know want to learn from, um, but tied to that, it is something I always try to express is that you know, obviously the kind of conversation around mentorship is that if you are able to receive it, you wanna make sure that the door's open for the person behind you. But 
to Lara, to your point, I do think it's also about your peers and lifting each other up together. So I, you know, while it's important to kind of like look ahead and look behind, I think it's really important to look to each other and learn from each other and create a network that can support you um, as, cause you know, we're all doing what we're doing for the first time always, it doesn't matter what age you are. Um, and so being able to, you know, develop that strong network to ask those questions, like how do you do this or how do you navigate that? I think, you know, I, I, I would guess that all of us would say that um, we wouldn't have made it to certain points in our life without being able to depend on those groups. So it's really important to find those people and, the, and those networks. I feel like Aki said all the things that I would also love to second, basically. We did talk about this before, so. We did. We're chatting, yeah. One other thing that we spoke about when we were talking about um, this discussion is, um, and this is, it goes back to that kind of specific advice thing. I think, um, figuring out that balance of like the work that uh, you feel really good about and not being so tied to how that's going to grow your financial life. Like I think there's that balance of um, making sure that you're doing work that feels good. And, and, and in our case, like, uh, and actually across the museum industry, probably like we're not making the same money someone that we went to school with doing a different type of design work might be making. So I think, but that feels fine and good to us. And that, that comes from maybe it's hard to talk about that without, without talking about or thinking about privilege, but I think that um, you can do this work and like still uh, have a great quality of life and, and it also just feels good. So 